residents of a remote Northern Territory community have stepped up their opposition to a major farming project over concerns about water security. Fortune Agribusiness has acquired a massive pastoral station 400 kilometres north of Alice Springs with plans to convert it into one of the largest fruit and vegetable farms in Australia. The company has been granted a massive groundwater licence which could eventually allow 40 billion litres of water to be extracted each year. But traditional owners and environmentalists are fighting the plan, saying there hasn't been proper consultation or consideration of the impact on the local community. The Drums' Lonnie Cooper has the detail. Back in 2016, Chinese-owned Fortune Agribusiness acquired the 300,000 hectare Singleton Station next to the remote Northern Territory community of Ali Karang. This is arid desert country. On average, the region gets less than 400 millimetres of rainfall each year. But the earth below Singleton Station is full of water and Fortune plans to convert the property into a massive fruit and vegetable farm. Fortune Agri's strategic growth plan is to stage the development of approximately 3,300 hectares of intensive irrigated horticulture, which on completion will be one of the largest fruit and vegetable operations in Australia. In 2021, the Northern Territory Government granted Fortune Agribusiness a 30-year licence to extract massive amounts of groundwater from the property for free. Up to 40 billion litres a year. Uh, over the 30-year licence life, uh, up to a trillion litres of water will be extracted, uh, which is twice the size of Sydney Harbour. Last year, traditional owners and environmental groups sued the Territory Government over the water licence. They cited a lack of consultation, as well as possible threats to sacred sites and the Alikarung community's future access to water. I think it'll make a big impact on the land. It's terrible if the water level drops and it'll soon produce salinity like salt. That groundwater supports significant cultural values across this landscape, and that's up to 40 sacred sites, uh, which include sacred trees, swamps and soaks. Uh, and that's a kind of an, it's an existential threat for this region. The matter is still before the courts. Our court case was heard in September um, and it's a waiting game, uh, but the Northern Territory Government has been making major changes to the water allocation plan and in response to that, kind of the, the fight for water justice continues. Ali Karung elders remain unanimously opposed to the water licence. They're already battling drinking water issues in the community. <laughs> and they've launched a water justice project, calling for First Nations communities to have more of a say over the precious resource. It is our land and it is our water, and we do have rights to this water too, you know. Lonnie Cooper reporting there and in a statement today, Fortune Agribusiness told the drum it has consulted with traditional owners and elders since 2016 and will continue to do so. It also says that it's working through the regulatory approvals process and will continue to engage with traditional owners as a priority. Fred, the water that would be extracted for the Singleton Station project would be drawn from a pretty massive aquifer under that part of Australia. What impact could groundwater extraction like this have on the local environment that we heard discussed there? Wow, Dan. It's the Murray-Darling Basin all over again. Free water given to big business and to give it to people to wreck the landscape and all for profit. It's not about our traditional connection to country. It's not about taking into consideration, um, you know, what water means to, to, to First Nations people. And I think that, you know, the government, the federal government should step in here and use their powers of intervention um, and protect that landscape and protect the system 
Dan, when we sat on the Kalgar River, you asked me about a, um, you know, our Mundagata and our connection to groundwater 85 kilometres away from the Kalgar River. The Mundagata story of the Rainbow Serpent is Australia wide. And to to extract water at such such amounts, it's exactly the Murray Darling Basin over again, and they're doing it in the north, you know. And, and I think it's disgraceful. And I think that you know the governments that make these decisions without listening to the people. And I really think that you know I've noticed that they've 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 um, approached the federal minister, Minister mm. Plevisic, about this 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 process as well. Well, I think this is a test case for the voice. Here are the First Nations people voicing their opinion on development in their country. We say old native title over. And I think that it's a prelude to what's going to happen if a voice gets up. Will the minister listen to the First Nations people or will the minister go with big business? Will, it, will the minister, you know, continue this capitalism process that's happening in this country and not listening to the First Nations people. The Prime Minister is up there saying, well, you know, we're going to listen to you. Let's start with this project. Let's start with these people in the Territory. And let's start with the Federal Government using their intervention powers, like they did with the intervention, to stop this, this process and um, to find other ways and, and, and mm. you know, other ways of, of, of development in that area or other ways of, um, you know, I suppose getting water well, because it's a disgrace as far as I'm concerned. And, yeah, and there have certainly been those calls. I think an open letter to Minister Plibersek, the Environment Minister today, for the federal government to step in and take some action here. Well, well the, for the uh, its part, the NT government points to a new strategic plan for water access across the Territory in a statement. This is what they had to say. The Territory Labor government remains committed to improving water security for all Territorians. The Territory Water Plan highlights 16 priority actions, including developing new safe drinking water legislation by 2024, driving transparency and improvement in drinking water quality, enhancing Aboriginal Territorians' participation in water management and improving our understanding of the cultural values of water, including through establishing an Aboriginal Water Advisory Council by 2024. So, Fred, the, the NT government, they're saying they're, they're committed to improving water security, that they've launched this first comprehensive long-term strategic plan for water with 16 priority actions. How do you react to that? They tried that with the Murray Darling Basin Plan. They tried it with, um, you know, with the states that, that are so, uh, associated with the Murray Darling Basin, and we all know where where, where that went. You know, Dan, I spent 16 years of my life um, advocating for water in the Murray Darling Basin, and um, um, a lot of that stuff falls on deaf ears when it comes to commercialisation and these big businesses, these big, you know, that that are controlling uh, a lot of these these things that are happening around around the water space. Um, in Australia, and um, you know, um, I think there was a there was a plan back in the 90s to move to move the um, the food production and the irrigation um, you know production to the north, and we're seeing that plan being put in place now. And, and you know, I think that yeah, the government can 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 do those things. They can put in advisory committees and and stuff like that. But will they listen to those advisory mm. committees? Um, the only way I think that we we can get we can get some security around a lot of these issues, whether it's water, whether it's land, whether it's social economic, is for us to to enter into an agreement with the federal government. Um, you know, around all these issues as well. I think that you know, I think it's time for a treaty. Mm. It's time for for the truth to be told in this country, and, and I think. You know, it's playing out in all these places now, especially in the Northern Territory. And, and please don't let what happened in the Murray Darling Basin happen in the Territory because we've got some of the most beautiful country in the world. And I think we can't destroy that. We've got such a rich culture as well and we can't destroy that, you know.
and listening to those old people talking there, um, you know, in that story, Dan. Mm. Was, I started to get emotional about, about how can we, we, we stop what's happening up there um, that's happened to the Murray Island Basin. Mm. Yeah, well, Catherine, I wonder, is the, the situation there, can it be informed by the Murray-Darling circumstances? And, and I wonder what your reaction is to the government's, NT government's uh, statement today. Yeah, look, I, I think absolutely it can be informed by the Murray Basin experience, but it can also be informed by the experience already here in the Northern Territory. So I'll give you an example of that. You know, the, the bore that sunk, that services the community of Murujulu, Aboriginal people at the time advised there was a problem with the water basin, that it wasn't deep enough and there would be ongoing supply issues. Government didn't listen. And what do we have now? We have a massive water supply problem for those mob at Murujulu. In some of those houses, you turn on a tap and all you get is a drip. Uh, and let's add to that the overcrowding in those houses. How do you wash your sheets? How do you keep your floors clean? How do you wash up your dishes if all you get is a drip of water? I think um, the other experience we've had, even here in Alice Springs, right, we have, and, and in the regions around us, there are areas where there have already been granted free massive water licences that have impacted even on our water supply here. So while we can still turn our taps on, the cost of our water will continue to rise because these water basins are not replenishable. So it's getting deeper and deeper and deeper and we can expect those costs to escalate even in an urban environment like Alice Springs. I think the other thing that twigs in my brain is, um, and this is the one that really twigs because it does not make sense to me. We're talking about Ali Karang and again Ali Karang is one of those communities that A, has water supply issues mm. B, has been told it can't have extra houses despite the problems of overcrowding and the socio-economic problems that are a result of that and social well-being problems that are a result of that because there isn't enough water to supply those houses. They've also been told them that they can't divisit, uh, develop new businesses because the water supply isn't good enough for them. And yet we can offer, and this doesn't make sense to me, we can offer, what is it, 40,000 megalitres of water worth between 70 to $300 million for free for the production of um, another business that's owned internationally. This beggars belief. And I think it also shows a fundamental pro problems in some of the structures we have in place at the moment. Native title is awesome, right? That proved that we have an ongoing relationship to the land. It proved that something went fundamentally wrong when Australia was colonised and our laws and governance and um, expertise was completely overridden. But it shows how weak that particular uh, mechanism is that a government should just come in over the top. And then the last layer to this, and it goes back to what everyone has been talking about here in the Northern Territory, and I suspect it's the case everywhere, our songs, our stories are tied to water. Mm. And that serpent um, they were just speaking about, he doesn't only travel in the skies, he travels mm. in those underwater basins and mm. triggers things related to ceremony. And those things relate to the care um, and maintenance of that really fragile environment what we know again as Aboriginal people, when those systems are interrupted and we're not able to care for those water systems, what we see is a collapse of the ecosystem around them and we see changes in the environment. And so that richness that comes with being able to maintain the ground, that richness that comes from being able to maintain our stories, and let's be really clear on this, our stories in many cases are not only the laws that govern the way we interact, they are the scientific frameworks and the the scientific observations that tell us how to care and how to keep this country um, really strong. So it shows we have a fundamental problem when governments start talking and businesses start, start talking about, we have consulted with people since 2016. Did you listen? Let's talk to an advisory group. Advisory groups are there to be listened to. They are not leadership groups that have decision-making authority. Mm, incredible points there. T Taylor, I want to go to some of the legal component of this. And under land rights law, traditional owners can say no to a development on Aboriginal freehold land, but th this project is on a pastoral lease. So what rights, what powers do traditional owners have then? very, very limited powers. We go back, you know, we go back to the Marbo decision, which obviously overturned this legal myth of 
terra nullius, you know, a land belonging to no one. And then later on down the track, we had the decision of what's known today as the WIC decision, and that dealt with competing interests. So we had pastoralists on one hand, and we had native title holders on the other, and they both had an interest over land. And the court had to decide what happens when there's a conflict between these two competing interests. And ultimately, the court decided pastoralists sit on top of native title and it trumps native title rights. But the court didn't answer the question of once that pastoral lease is up, say it was 90 years, what happens to native title then? Is it revived or is it, does it come back or is it just suspended? It didn't answer that decision in the week, but it did in Fijo, which came a year later. And that, that decision basically said, okay, well, when there's a competing interest and native title, uh, na the pastoralist trump native title, then native title is extinguished forever and there's no reviving. But then, you know, a year after that, we had Yamir, which is a 1999 case. And that, that that, dis that considered how native title applied offshore. So something that the previous application oh, native title um, case has never considered, you know, that all applied to the land. But Yamir said, what, what rights do native title have o over the seabed? And the court basically held that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people could, ha could have rights to the seabed on an individual basis. And exactly what Uncle Fred said is that when there's commercial and you know commercial corporations involved it all goes back to them and that's exactly what happened you have fisheries that can you know harvest the seabed or, or commercial quantities but under native title we can only ha harvest the seabed on an individual scale not that we'd want to you know harvest it on a commercial quantity but these are the rights this is this is everything that native title it's you know the ghost the Native title may have been, um, terra nullius may have been overturned, but the ghost of terra nullius still lingers in these licences. What do you mean? What do you mean by that when you say the ghost of terra nullius lingers? Well, two things. I think uh, it it comes at a great cost. All these native title applications and rights to freehold land, Aboriginal people pay two costs. One, it's the loss of land, and secondly, it's the autonomy over the land. This is what we mean. We're not here. We're not here. The government doesn't see us. They can hear us. They're saying you need to do something about this, but they never do. Mm. And, and um, I just want to ask you one other question. Has the, qu the, the question about water rights been explored through those legal avenues or is it just around the seabeds? And where does that sit in amongst this discussion? Yeah, they have. I, they have been considered, um, and, and I wish I had known. I knew more about it. But when we look to New Zealand, let's let's have a look what they're doing. Yeah. They have rivers that have. They're, they're their own entity. They can't be bought. They can't be sold. That's much like our our perspective. Yeah. You know, the the water. It's a it's a relative to us. It can't be bought. It can't be sold. It's part of our kinship system. Water is life. Let's look to what New Zealand's doing. Why aren't we doing that here? We're so behind. Australia is so behind on many different levels. Uh, Wes, I want to bring you in because the Central Land Council says that traditional owners have been denied a seat at the table in negotiations with government on big water and agribusiness projects. How do you reconcile that with the earlier statement that we've heard from uh, the business saying, yep, we've been consulting since 2016, government saying we're going to set up some committees uh, by next year to, to, to consult more? Well, I think what's been said earlier too is like you can easily set up a consultative committee that that can maybe even agree with you if you wanted yeah. to. I mean, you, you pick and choose the advice you want to hear often, and also the complexity of people's ears. You know, sometimes white ears aren't complex enough to understand the nuance of the discussions going around. That you know, you need multiple perspectives along the way. I mean, and also this, I've got this image of where they're taking water from a pastoral lease that then affects a whole water basin, those soaks and rivers and those moments where the water comes up. And, like, that's got cultural significance. And often we, we get caught in this conversation, which is Aboriginal people are anti-development, and I don't think we are. You know, we've been developing the land for millennia. So this notion of how do we engage in less of an extractive relationship and more of a regenerative relationship with what's possible maybe it's not possible to take that much water out and make that much fruit and veggies you know but maybe there's a better level and let's talk about that mm, interesting points we well, say the grassroots campaign for a yes vote in the referendum on an indigenous voice to parliament got underway in earnest thousands of people gathered at about 30 community events across the country organized by the yes 23 campaign in brisbane the day of action kicked off with an address by the minister for indigenous australians linda burney how often do we get the chance to put our shoulder against the wheel of history and give it a bit of a shove?